Hello friends, I am Assistant Professor Vinod Kumar Ashok Pradhan, Department of English, Sadashirav Mandlik Mahavidyale Murugud, District Kolhapur, Maharashtra. In this audio, we are going to learn about On Saying Please by A.G. Gardiner. This essay is prescribed for BA Part 1 from 2019-20 onwards. First, let's read the introduction of this essay. Alfred George Gardiner, who was born in 1865 and died in 1946, was a British journalist and author. His essays written under the pen name Alpha of the Plow are highly praised. He has painted uniformly elegant, graceful and humorous essays. His uniqueness is found in his ability to teach the basic truths of life in an easy and amusing manner. Pillars of society, pebbles on the shore, many furrows and leaves in the wind are some of his best known writings. His essays have a refreshing frankness talks to us with the intimacy of friend. The present essay talks about everyday civilities of behavior. Gardiner points out that good and bad manners affect our daily life very much. Good manners help the machine of our life oiled and running sweetly. Bad manners infect the world by poisoning the stream of life. It shows how using nice words like thank you and please can change the course of our day. Friends, here ends the introduction of A.G. Gardiner. Now, we are going to read actual essay by him. I will give you the number of paragraph when I'll read this essay. So, let's start on saying please by A.G. Gardiner. Paragraph 1. The young liftman in a city office who threw a passenger out of his lift the other morning and was fined for the offence was undoubtedly in the wrong. It was a question of pleas. The complainant entering the lift said, Top. The liftman demanded, Top, please. And this concession being refused, he not only declined to comply with the instruction but hurled the passenger out of the lift. This, of course, was carrying a comment on manner too far. Discourtesy is not a legal offense and it does not excuse assault and battery. If a burglar breaks into my house and I knock him down, the law will acquit me. And if I am physically assaulted, it will permit me to retaliate with reasonable violence. It does this because the burglar and my assailant have broken quite definite commands of the law. But no legal system could attempt to legislate against bad manners or could sanction the use of violence against something which it does not itself recognize as a legally punishable offense. And whatever our sympathy with the liftman, we must admit that the law is reasonable. It would never do if we were at liberty to box people's ears because we did not like their behavior or the tone of their voices or the scowl on their faces. Our fists would never be idle and the gutters of the city would run with blood all day. Paragraph number 2 I may be as uncivil as I may please and the law will protect me against violence retaliation. I may be haughty or boorish and there is no penalty to pay except the penalty of being written down an ill-mannered fellow. The law does not compel me to say please or to attune my voice to other people's sensibilities any more than it says that I shall not wax my moustache or dye my hair or wear ringlets down my back. 
it does not recognize the laceration of our feelings as a case of compensation. There is no allowance for moral and intellectual damages in these matters. Paragraph number 3 This does not mean that the damages are negligible. It is probable that the liftman was much more acutely hurt by what he regarded as a slur upon his social standing and than he would have been if he had a kick on the shins, for which he could have got a legal redress. The pain of a kick on the shins soon passes away, but the pain of a wound to our self-respect or our vanity may poison a whole day. I can imagine that Liftman denied the relief of throwing the author of his wound out of the lift, brooding over the insult by the hour, and visiting it on his wife in the evening as the only way of restoring his equilibrium. For there are few things more catching than bad temper and bad manners. When Sir Anthony Absolute uh, bullied Captain Absolute, the latter went out and bullied his man. Fag, whereupon Fag went out downstairs and kicked the page boy. Probably the man who said, Top, to the liftman was really only getting back on his employer who had not said good morning to him because he himself had been handpecked at breakfast by his wife to whom the cook had been insolent because the housemaid had answered her back. We infect the world with our ill humors. Bad manners probably do more to poison the stream of the general life than all the crimes in the calendar. For one wife who gets a black eye from an otherwise good-natured husband, there are a hundred who live a life of martyrdom under the shadow of a morose temper. But all the same, the law cannot become the guardian of our private manners, no decalogue could cover the vast area of offences and no court could administer a law which governed our social civilities, our speech, the tilt of our eyebrows and all our moods and manners. Paragraph number 4 But though we are bound to endorse the verdict against the liftman, most people will have a certain sympathy with him. While it is true that there is no law that compels us to say please, there is a social practice much older and much more sacred than any law which enjoins us to be civil. And the first requirement of civility is that we should acknowledge a service. Please and thank you are the small change with which we pay our way as social beings. They are the little courtesies by which we keep the machine of life oiled and running sweetly. They put our intercourse upon the basis of a friendly cooperation and easy give and take instead of on the basis of superiors dictating to inferiors. It is a very vulgar mind that would wish to command where he can have the service for asking and have it with willingness and good feeling instead of resentment. Paragraph number 5 I should like to feature in this connection my friend, the polite conductor. By this discriminating title, I do not intend to suggest a rebuke to conductors generally. On the contrary, I am disposed to think that there are few classes of men who come through the ordeal of a very trying calling better than bus conductors too. Here and there you will meet an unpleasant specimen who regards the passengers as his natural enemies, as creatures whose chief purpose on the bus is to cheat him and who can only be kept reasonably honest by a loud voice and an aggressive manner. But this type is rare, rarer than it used to be. I fancy the public owes much to the underground railway company, which also runs the buses, for insisting on 
a certain standard of civility in its servants and taking care that that standard is observed. In doing this, it not only makes things pleasant for the traveling public, but reforms an important social service. Paragraph number 6 It is not, therefore, with any feeling of unfriendliness to conductors as a class that I pay a tribute to a particular member of that class. I first became conscious of his existence one day when I jumped onto a bus and found that I had left home without any money in my pocket. Everyone has had the experience and knows the feeling, the mixed feeling, which the discovery arrives as. You are annoyed because you look like a fool at the best and like a knave at the worst. You would not be at all surprised if the conductor eyed you coldly as much as to say, Yes, I know that stale old trick. Now then, off you get. And even if the conductor is a good fellow and lets you down easily, you are faced with the necessity of going back and the inconvenience, perhaps, of missing your train or your engagement. Paragraph number 7 Having searched my pockets in vain for stray coppers and having found I was utterly penniless, I told the conductor with as honest a face as I could assume that I could not pay the fare and must go back for money. Oh, you needn't get off. That's all right, he said. All right, said I, but I haven't a copper on me. Oh, I'll book you through, he replied. Where do you want to go? And he handled his bundle of tickets with the air of a man who was prepared to give me a ticket for anywhere from the bank to Hong Kong. I said it was very kind of him and told him where I wanted to go. And as he gave me the ticket, I said, But where shall I send the fare? Oh, you'll see me some day, all right? He said cheerfully as he turned to go. And then, luckily, my fingers, still wandering in the corners of my packets, lighted on a shilling and the account was squared. But that fact did not lessen the glow of pleasure which so good-natured an action had given me. Paragraph number 8 A few days after, my most sensitive toe was trampled on rather heavily as I sat reading on the top of a bus i looked up with some anger and more agony and saw my friend of the cheerful countenance sorry sir he said i know these are heavy boots got them because my own feet trod on so much and now i am treading on other people's hope i didn't hurt you sir he had hurt me but he was so nice about it that i assured him he hadn't after this, I began to observe him whenever I boarded his bus and found a curious pleasure in the constant good nature of his bearing. He seemed to have an inexhaustible fund of patience and a gift for making his passengers comfortable. I noticed that if it was raining, he would run up the stairs to give someone the tip that there was room inside. With old people, he was as considerate as a son, and with children, as solicitous as a father. He had evidently a peculiarly warm place in his heart for young people, and always indulged in some merry jest with them. If he had a blind man on board, it was not enough to set him down safely on the pavement. He would call to Bill in front to wait while he took him across the road or round the corner or otherwise safely on his way. In short, I found that he irradiated such an atmosphere of good temper and kindliness that a journey with him was a lesson in natural courtesy and good manners. Paragraph number 9 what struck me particularly was the ease with which he got through his work, 
if bad manners are infectious so also are good manners if we encounter incivility most of us are apt to become uncivil but it is an unusually uncouth person who can be disagreeable with sunny people it is with manners as with the weather nothing clears of my spirits like a fine day said keats and a cheerful person descends on even the gloomiest of us with something of the textbook benediction of a fine day and so it was always fine weather on the polite conductor's bus and his own civility his conciliatory address and good humored bearing infected his passengers in lightening their spirits he lightened his own task his gaiety was not a wasteful luxury but a sound investment paragraph number 10 i have missed him from my bus route of late but i hope that only means that he has carried his sunshine on to another road it cannot be too widely diffused in a rather drab world and i make no apologies for writing a panegyric on an unknown bus conductor if wordsworth could gather lessons of wisdom from the poor leech gatherer on the lonely moor i see no reason why lesser people should not take lessons in conduct from one who shows how a very modest calling may be dignified by good temper and kindly feeling It is a matter of general agreement that the war has had a chilling effect upon those little everyday civilities of behavior that sweeten the general air. We must get those civilities back if we are to make life kindly and tolerable for each other. We cannot get them back by invoking the law. The policeman is a necessary symbol and the law is a necessary institution for a society that is still somewhat lower than the angels. But the law can only protect us against material attack. Nor will the liftman's way of meeting moral affront by physical violence help us to restore the civilities. I suggested to him that he would have had a more subtle and effective revenge if he had treated the gentleman who would not say please with elaborate politeness. He would have had the victory not only over the boor but over himself and that is the victory that counts. The polite man may lose the material advantage. but he always has the spiritual victory i commend to the liftman a story of chesterfield in his time the london streets were without the pavements of today and the man who took the wall had the driest footing i never gave the wall to a scoundrel said a man who met chesterfield one day in the street i always do said Chesterfield stepping with a bow into the road i hope the liftman will agree that his revenge was much more sweet than if he had flung the fellow into the mud friends this is the end of the essay on saying please by a g gardiner thank you very much mm-hmm.